So yeah, so welcome to the, the Respiratory Week. Um, I'm going to give a talk on the drugs used in asthma and COPD. There's a bit of a, just a basic overview of all the mechanisms and the indications and the different routes and things that we give these medications in. It should really just be a refresher. There shouldn't be too much new stuff here. Will's then going to go through um, some chest x-rays, and then we've got Will Ricketts, a consultant from BART, coming to lead um, a very popular talk on um, respiratory case studies. So we're going to go through some of the modes de of delivery. We'll then just run through the different um, medications that are generally used in asthma and COPD. And, and then at the, the end, I've kind of got the summaries of the, the treatment regimes, both for chronic control and also for use in the acute setting. Um, so modes of delivery is a, a really important thing to get your head around, um, not only for the written exam, not only for your clinical practice, but also for the OSCEs. It's a common station to get you to explain inhalers and peak flows and things like this. So this is a, a common thing. So obviously some of these medications are given orally. The mainstay are inhalers, and we have the different types of inhalers. So the meter dose is the standard one where you have to click down, breathe in at the same time. That's commonly the one that you'll be asked to explain. Um, the breath-activated ones, so these are better for uh, older people um, that might not be able to coordinate or people with um, arthritis that can't press down the lever. That's just based on them breathing in and it sucks the medication in. Um, spacers can be used. They're commonly used in children. There's no reason why they can't be used in adults that might be able to, might have difficulty in that coordination. It just adds a chamber which allows more gentle uh, inhalation of the medications. And this website here has great explanations of how you use all of these devices. So if you've got five minutes, it's well worth reading through before the OSCE and just practicing explaining some of these different types of inhalers. Obviously, in the acute setting, um, we use nebulizers. Um, there's some studies that show that actually the amount of drug delivered from 10 puffs of salbutamol is equivalent to a nebulizer of um, salbutamol. But one benefit certainly of nebulizers in the acute setting, if someone's really unwell and out of breath, they can just sit there with a mask on and don't have to worry about giving the inhalers. The other benefit is if they've got an oxygen requirement, um, you can run oxygen through the nebulizer. So you're not relying on just breathing air. You can run the nebulizer through oxygen, therefore treating the hypoxia as well at, at the same time as the symptoms. In the, the really sick people, then we can obviously move to intravenous therapies. So the beta agonists are the mainstay. Um, they act directly on smooth muscle to cause the bronchodilation in the lungs. They have a rapid onset, so very effective. They can also be used in a sort of preventive um, fashion if someone has a known trigger for that asthma, such as exercise. They can take their inhalers um, before that. There are long-acting versions as well at, later on in the chronic um, stages, um, and they are used in both asthma and COPD. There's reports that there's limited benefit in young babies, so if people coming in with wheeze kind of under a year, then there's thoughts that actually the beta receptors haven't developed then, so there's not much point giving salbutamol. But generally in practice you'll see that we'll often give a trial of it, because if it does work, then it's, it's beneficial to give. For those that really want to know how they work, that's there. But effectively, in short, um, they act on the beta-2 um, receptors. That causes a rise in cyclic AMP. More cyclic AP means less calcium, which means bronchodilation because of the role calcium plays on smooth muscle constriction. If there's less calcium around, then the muscles will relax. And we'll keep coming back to that cyclic AMP and calcium. That's how a lot of these medications work. So obviously, you'll all know that the, the most common is salbutamol in use. That can be given in pretty much any formulation. Um, the long-acting ones are salmeterol and fulmeterol. Um, and the side effects are all those sort of things that we already know. Fine tremor kind of forms part of our respiratory exam, just to see if perhaps these people are on them long term. Um, hyperkalemia is one to watch out for if someone's on back-to-back -back nebulizers on salbutamol infusions that could cause a hyperkalemia. That is a, a therapeutic benefit in people with hyperkalemia. As you know, we treat that with salbutamol, but it does mean we have to monitor it in people that we're treating with salbutamol. It can also cause tachycardias and arrhythmias, and we've recently had a child on the ward that went into a, a paroxysmal SVT after being started on a salbutamol infusion. So, you know, these do have side effects, and, and we do, do need to keep an eye out for them. So the anti-muscarinics, so um, they are, uh, work on the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, and effectively... <coughs> 
dry up the lung by reducing the mucus and also have an effect on bronchodilation as well. They generally have a longer action, so don't need to be given quite so frequently as salbutamol, and again, uh, used in both conditions. Ipotropium bromide is the, uh, the one used in the acute setting, um, and teotropium is a longer acting that you might see used in the chronic effect. Um, as with all anti-muscarinics, anticholinergics, they cause dry mouth, they can cause nausea, they can cause constipation, need to be careful with them in people with glaucoma and um, bladder outlet obstruction. Does anyone know what the methylxanthines are? <coughs> theophylline and another one? Aminophylline, yes. Yeah. So theophylline and aminophylline. Theophylline is only given orally. Aminophylline can be given orally and also as IV. It's important to note that a loading dose is required. So if someone's coming in with severe asthma that's not responded to salbutamol, um, hasn't responded to hypotropium, you're, you're going to be moving towards <coughs> IV medications, then these are a good one to go towards, but if they don't normally take an uh, aminophilin or theophylin, then you need to give them a loading dose. If they already take it, then you don't need to give that loading dose. And in fact, giving the loading dose could be dangerous because they have a, they have a small therapeutic window. How do these work? So they have a few mechanisms. So one, they're a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Um, phosphodiesterases um, break down cyclic AMP. Um, so if you block that, then you get Increase cyclic AMP, which has the same effect as the beta-2 agonists. They also uh, have an action on adenosine, um, and adenosine in the lungs causes bronch bronchoconstriction. So if you, if you block that, then you have bronchodil uh, bronchodilation. And that's, you know, when we give adenosine for an SVT, that's why people get that sensation of severe <coughs> crushing chest pain. They have a tightness in the chest, fear of impending doom. That's because of the adenosine receptors in the lung which pro pro uh, creates a, a therapeutic dilemma in our child that had an SVD because of salbutamol. They're having a severe asthma attack. They're in SVT. We need to give adenosine, but that will cause a bronchoconstriction. Um, on balance, we gave the adenosine and that cardioverted her. But uh, medicine isn't always clear cut. It also has a, a genetic effect on histone deacetylase activators. Um, and these are basically used in chronic, severe uh, asthma and COPD. This is not kind of a routine thing to start people on. As I mentioned, they have a therapeutic range. So if people are taking them regularly, we need to monitor it. We need to be careful about giving it IV and people are already on it because um, we can cause um, side effects. Standard kind of side effect profiles are nausea, vomiting, gastrointestinal disturbances. But they too, like salbutamol, have severe effects on um, uh, the heart. So it can cause palpitations and arrhythmias. And basically, this is just a nice little diagram that kind of gives that overview of where all of these medications work. So we've got ATP, adenylase cyclase, leading to cyclic AMP. And the more cyclic AMP that we have, um, the lower the calcium we have, which causes bronchodilation. And that's where the beta agonists work. Again, if we block the phosphodiesterase, um, we get a build-up of cyclic AMP. And if we block the adenosine, we get more bronchodilation. And that's where theophylline and aminophilin work and then the acetylcholine with the muscarinic antagonists. So they all kind of feed into the same pathway to, to treat these conditions. Corticosteroids, um, as you know, will be used in both the acute setting and in the chronic control. We all know how corticosteroids work. They affect the genes. They change gene transcription to promote a lot of anti-inflammatory effects. Um, and all in all, they reduce the inflammation in the lungs, they reduce the edema, and they reduce the secretions. Now, they can be given in a lot of ways. So they can be given inhaled for people that can um, just kind of have a, a mild to moderate um, symptoms. The thing for the OSCEs here, what do you always advise people that are on steroid inhalers? Rinse the mouth out because of thrush, good. Um, and in the acute setting, the, the balance between prednisolone and IV hydrocortisone, there really isn't one. Because they're slow-acting drugs, because they work by tra gene transcription and things, it, you know, they are slow-acting. They're not going to kick in the minute you give them. So if someone is able to take oral prednisolone, then they may as well have that. There's the, the reason for giving IV hydrocortisone is if they're in such shortness of breath that they can't really swallow or they're vomiting um, and you need to get the steroids into them. But in terms of the acute relief of those symptoms, there's no difference between prednisolone and hydrocortisone. 
and I'm sure you know all of that. I'm not going to go through this side. Again, this is basic final stuff, the side effects um, of, of corticosteroids. You will undoubtedly get a question on it somewhere in the exam. Um, so know it, um, and obviously also know the importance of about weaning of steroids and what can happen when you don't have them. So the leukotriene receptor antagonists are a relatively newer um, class of medications. Um, they block the effect of the cystine leukotrienes. Um, and if people remember the arachidonic acid <coughs> pathway, the cyclooxygenase enzymes that lead to prostaglandins and thromboxanes, they're, they're what's blocked by NSAIDs. So that's why we, there's a theoretical risk of ibuprofen and you can get aspirin-induced um, asthma. Because if you block this cyclooxygenase enzyme, you get an overflow down this pathway that leads to more leukotrienes um, which can cause irritation, they release histamine in the lungs and you get um, bronchospasm. So the Montelukast and uh, Zafilukast aim to block that leukotriene pathway to try and stop that. So it's very useful in that kind of aspirin and exercise-induced asthma that's reliant on this side of the graph. Um, they're the ones that are used. Similar profiles. If, if you're ever in doubt with side effects, you'll say gastrointestinal disturbance and rash. It will probably serve you well. The anti-IgE monoclonal antibody omalzuzumab is in use now. Um, it's used for very severe allergic asthma. Um, it can only be initiated by specialists because it costs so much um, and has to be given every two to four weeks. As you'd expect, it acts on um, blocking the IgE, which is obviously our allergy um, immunoglobulin, so it has a good effect, but it does come with a myriad of side effects that all kind of monoclonal antibodies do. It can cause hypersensitivity reactions, it can cause all manner of things. Um, so they're not used lightly, but in someone that you can't just get on, tr on top of their asthma, then it might be considered. Some other things to note, so as you'll know, you can combine a lot of these medications, so the beta-2 agonists with steroids are often combined um, just to, to aid compliance effectively because people don't have to take as many medications. Magnesium sulfate can be used in the acute setting. Um, the mechanism isn't completely understood. It's thought because magnesium resembles calcium, um, then it competes for calcium at the uh, membrane and therefore might cause some um, uh, relaxation of the muscles. But it has been shown to, to work. Chromoglycate is a, another uh, inhaled medication. It's not fully understood how it works, but can be used in um, asthma. Um, Pregnancy and breastfeeding with asthma. So obviously it's really important to maintain adequate control of a pregnant lady that might have asthma. Studies have shown about a third of patients with asthma will get better during their pregnancy, a third will get worse, and a third it won't really have any impact. Um, for breastfeeding, all of the medications are uh, considered safe. In terms of pregnancy, so the beta agonists are deemed safe um, in uh, all, all of their forms. Um, beta agonists are actually used in, in premature labor because they act to, as a totalytic to stop the uterus um, contracting. Um, so they are safe to use. Um, inhaled steroids are deemed safe. The oral steroids have been shown that there might be an increased risk of congenital abnormalities if used in the first trimester. But as with all things in medicine, it's kind of a risk balance. If that patient has such severe asthma that they're reliant on those oral steroids, then it's actually more important that that asthma is controlled um, so they don't end up in ITU um, than it is um, for the potential theoretical low risk of the congenital abnormality. Because babies, although they um, live in a relatively hypoxic environment, if the mum is hypoxic on top of that, then it can have obviously more profound effects than just the theoretical risk of... Um, the congenital abnormality. The leukotriene inhibitors, they're relatively new, so there haven't been many studies done, but generally have, it's been shown to be really beneficial in that lady, and um, then you can continue them, and there's no studies yet for the anti-IgE monoclonal. Some other ones that are used in COPD but not asthma, so carbocysteine um, is a mucolytic, which basically reduces the thick, um, sticky mucus that a lot of people get in COPD has been shown to reduce the number of exacerbations in people with that. Roflumilast, I've 
never seen used, but that again is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, so again acting on um, cyclic AMP um, and is licensed to be used in CAPD. And doxapram is a res respiratory stimulant. So this is kind of an end-of-the-line drug that someone's coming in with respiratory failure. If they're not suitable to be put on non-invasive ventilation, then you might consider using doxapram. Um, and that kind of acts um, essentially as a respiratory stimulant to help their respiratory failure. Um, but I think that's quite specialist and uh, seniors would be getting involved by that stage. Long-term oxygen therapy. Um, so this is obviously a, an end-stage thing for people with COPD, typically COPD, um, although it is worth noting it is used in a lot of other conditions such as neuromuscular disorders, um, a lot of neonates with chronic lung disease from um, prematurity will go home on home oxygen. In adults, in terms of COPD, there's these quite strict criteria about who gets long-term oxygen and who doesn't. So they have to be shown when stable, so not in a, an acute infection, when stable, if they have a POU2 of less than 7.3, um, then they'll be eligible for it. Or they can have a slightly higher PAO2, so between 7.3 and 8 kilopascals, but if they've got evidence of not being able to tolerate that. So if they're polycythemic in response, um, if they've got hypoxemia overnight, um, and if they've you know, kind of got evidence of um, pulmonary hypertension, per peripheral edema, kind of failure, evidence of failure of their, their body, and then you will, will allow a higher um, kilopascal. As you probably know, the benefit in COPD is only seen if it's used pretty much most of the day. So 15 hours over is um, uh, where the benefit starts to seem. The substantial benefit is only over 19 hours of the day. So it's, it's a huge commitment for the patient that's going to go on to it because they have to effectively wear it the whole time. What's one of the main contraindications is smoking. What's the main cause of COPD is smoking. So you know people have to agree to give up on the smoking because of the, the dangers of having... Um, flames around pure oxygen. Um, so it's not for everyone. It is a big commitment, but it has some um, mortality and morbidity effects if used for those um, lengths of time. So we've gone through that. Obviously, inhaled treatments are preferred, but we will move to orals and IVs if needed. Um, and what I've done is just pull together the, the, the main recommendations for the, 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 the chronic and acute management. This is, again, classic final stuff. It will come up again and again all through your, throughout your career. You're just going to have to sit down and learn it. Um, it's quite simple once you sit down and, and get your head around it. In terms of the acute asthma exacerbation, this is the path you're going to kind of follow generally um, and always reassessing your treatments and, and not being afraid to, to go up to the next stage if you're worried. Similarly for COPD, we can see, based on their uh, lung function test, there's a grading, what kind of things we might be adding in. And the COPD uh, initial exacerbation is kind of similar to um, the asthma. I'm sure Will touched on it in his oxygen talk. You know, hypoxia kills before hypercapnia. There's always that kind of fear about giving oxygen to someone with COPD. But if they're hypoxic, then put the oxygen on. You're, you're going to be reassessing. You're going to be there. If they suddenly become drowsy and, and pass out on you, then you'll you know, put two and two together, think maybe that was the oxygen. And you're probably going to be repeating gases and stuff before that happens. So you know, if they're hypoxic, put on the oxygen, and then you can titrate it down to maintain the SATs um, that you want. It's only people with known hypercarbia that you, it's going to worry you, and that's not everyone with COPD. So don't be too afraid of it. Um, so I hope, that just kind of to refresh your memory before Will's talk later on the me mechanisms, the kind of indications, some of the basics behind it. Um, does anyone have any questions on that? I know it's a very heavy theoretical talk. Um, not much interactivity. I apologize for that. Um, but there's much more interaction coming later. So that's just the uh, bones of it, I'm afraid. Okay, I'll be around as always afterwards. Thanks. <laughs>